Hi, my name is Jeffrey Biggs from Open Robotics. I'm going to be talking today about work we're doing to improve the communications layer of robot applications with ROS2 and Xeno. I'll start by describing the robot operating system for those who are not aware of the concept, then talk a bit about the experiences with DDS that we've had in robotics, I'll move on to talk about the potential Xeno for ROS and robotics applications, I'll give a brief preview of the evaluation work we've been doing with Xeno, and then follow up with some conclusions. So Open Robotics was established in 2012, originally as the Open Source Robotics Foundation. It's a privately held company of about 50 employees, uh, spread all over the world, uh, and we are the founders and key contributors and curators of the world's most widely used robot software, ROS. So ROS is a very widely used open source uh, development kit for robotics. Uh, it is basically what uh, Android is to mobility, is ROS to robotics. We have a huge number of users around the world, uh, relatively speaking, um, over 178,000 a month last year, uh, probably more this year because we keep seeing a very large increase every year, uh, many page views, and we have a very global impact. Um, the United States, for example, where ROS originated, is only 90% of users. Uh, ROS provides core services for robotics. It provides facilities such as message passing, uh, robotics, primitives, sensor abstractions, and development tools such as visualization tools and debugging tools. It's multi-platform working on the major OSs such as Linux, Windows and Mac OS, uh, but it also works on several real-time operating systems and embedded operating systems. ROS2 is the second version of ROS. Uh, it started eight years ago uh, in 2014 and it provides enhanced capabilities compared with ROS1. Uh, it provides some support for real-time execution, it supports much better multi-threaded execution, uh, supports multi-robot fleets, uh, and it works well over legacy and lossy networks. Uh, so if you look at uh, something like a LAMP stack or a mean stack, um, where LAMP is the Linux, Apache, MySQL, PHP stack for web services, um, for ROS provides for robotics the plumbing tools, capabilities, and ecosystem that you need uh, in order to build your robot applications. The ROS architecture is based around abstracted communications. Uh, so looking at this diagram, you can see we have a ROS application, um, which is built on top of a ROS client library. Uh, for example, RCLCPP is the C++ client library. Uh, then that is built on top of what we call the RMW, or ROS middleware layer. Uh, and that is providing an abstract API that um, interfaces to a middleware. Uh, the most commonly used middlewares are, um, in ROS are Fast DDS and Cyclone DDS. Uh, we also see usage of, of Connects DDS. One of the interesting things about this abstraction of the middleware is that the middleware itself is swappable. So for example, you could swap out Cyclone DDS and use Fast DDS instead. Uh, it's not just DDS either, you can use other middlewares. Uh, we see, for example, people using a middleware called ECAL, which is from the Continental Motor Company. Um, or, in our case, what we're interested in is perhaps swapping out the middleware and using Xeno. And the reason for this is because uh, we have had uh, eight years of using DDS and ROS-powered robots now. Uh, ROS1 used a custom protocol on top of TCP. ROS2 switched to um, DDS. But ROS2 is being used in an increasingly wide variety of application scenarios and network environments. Uh, this means that we have struggled with DDS in many of these because these applications are often distributed across multiple subnets where the, the, the default discovery method of DDS does not work. Uh, there may be improperly configured wireless networks, which are more common than you think. And this means that, this, that you have a situation where a DDS discovery storm can easily bring down a network. And anything that goes across the internet, which is something that's becoming increasingly common in robotics. ROS uses DDS in ways that can also appear to be unexpected. Uh, for example, every ROS node starts many topics by default for internal infrastructure reasons, and uh, ROS applications also tend to create a lot of application-level topics. And we found that DDS, um, the DDS design tends to struggle with very large numbers of topics per node. Uh, this, as a result, we've struggled to scale DDS without manual configuration, uh, and that is something that's quite difficult because for us, we want to have uh, a nice out-of-the-box user experience. Outside of simple applications and network environments, um, manual configuration and tuning is required for a DDS, uh, and even a relatively straightforward network can cause problems, such as a wireless network between a desktop and a robot, or using a Docker container, 
or a computer with multiple network interfaces. These are all cases where we have seen problems with, with DDS and often these problems have been encountered by new users. Uh, these new users of ROS2 are typically unaware that DDS is even being used. To them, they're using ROS2. They don't know that it uses DDS internally. Um, and so they don't, aren't aware that it's being used and that they might need to configure it for their network, um, which means that when their application fails due to DDS, they blame ROS2. And discovery failures in particular have been a bit of a problem for us. Uh, discovery failures are opaque and the most common cause of problems in ROS2. Uh, the Descult discovery protocol of DDS is approximately quadratic in network traffic. Uh, so as the number of nodes grows and the number of topics in particular grows, and as I mentioned, we have a lot of topics in ROS2, when this means that uh, the discovery traffic is, is very high. And when discovery fails, you don't get an error. You just Your application just does not work. Uh, and the application fails to work, but DDS is functioning as expected, which means there's no error to be produced. So we've had to implement things to work around how DDS discovery works, such as, for example, to make the tools responsive a graph daemon that runs locally and provides cache to ROS node graph information. And without this, the tools would often not work properly. They'd miss out uh, information from the ROS graph, uh, which means that the tools would be basically non-functional. So our problem is that we want a smooth, problem-free, out-of-the-box experience for new users, and DDS does not enable us to offer it. Xeno offers a new hope for us, uh, for better communications. Uh, Xeno provinces a simpler protocol, lower resource use, lower discovery pressure, and it has features for widely distributed applications, such as across multiple subnets and even the internet. Uh, Xeno uses TCP by default, which is better in the average case, which is what we're concerned about. UDP is very good if you've got a network that can work with it, um, but the average new user case, we really want to have something that's going to work well for them and let the experts tune their networks for their specific cases. Um, this means that uh, also Xeno handles lossy Wi-Fi networks and wide area networks better because of the TCP use. And it doesn't fall over as soon as you leave the local wide LAN segment. Um, we also think that Xeno development is not stalled by a slow standardization process. Uh, this could be seen as a negative because there's only one implementation of Xeno available. Um, but for us, we are looking for rapid feature development um, to support the feature development of ROS2 and improve our experience. So we have evaluated whether Xeno has the potential to improve our out-of-the-box user experience. Uh, in several network environments, somewhere where we've seen DDS fail, we looked at did Xeno work with default settings, what sort of ballpark throughput could we achieve, and what is the network load of discovery. To evaluate this, we produced a sample ROS application. Uh, this was originally produced by iRobot to do evaluation of ROS. Uh, it's called the Mont Blanc scenario. And it's representative of a simple robot application. It has 20 nodes and 23 topics, which I'm aware seems like a lot compared with most example applications, but most robotics applications typically have more nodes and more topics, far more topics than this. Uh, they get very, very complex. We also have message data types ranging from single integers to 80 megabyte point clouds that need to be delivered in a timely fashion at various different uh, execution rates. So some of the interesting results that we've seen, um, first of all, discovery traffic uh, versus application traffic. If you look at the packet counts for discovery in Xeno versus DDS, you can see there's a huge difference. Um, we'll ignore scenario one because we had problems in DDS where it would uh, refuse to use anything other than the shared memory for transport, which is why it's an artifact that has discovery packets 100%. Um, for all the other scenarios, and you can see that Xeno tends to have discovery packets at about 5 to 10%, um, usually no more than that. But DDS, you can see it's ranging between 30 and 40%. And so this means that if you're running a DDS application, um, a DDS robot application using ROS2, um, more than a third of your network traffic is simply for discovery. Um, and that's, that's a huge amount. And it's going to impact your network performance and your application performance. Uh, if you look at multicast traffic versus unicast traffic, uh, as I mentioned, multicast is somewhere that's been a particular pain point for us, and it's what DDS discovery is built on. Um, the, in Xeno, the multicast traffic only extends to discovering where other nodes are, and then it switches to unicast for the rest of the discovery process. And so as a result, the, the multicast packet count is so low that it's barely visible in the graph. Um, the remainder is unicast packets to finish off discovery, and then switching over to TCP for data transfer. On the other hand, in DDS, the multicast is uh, very visible because all the discovery traffic is going over multicast. 
um, prior to doing um, prior to doing the final transfer of discovery data. Uh, so our conclusions about Xeno, um, basically we like it. It's performant, it's efficient uh, as a middleware. Um, while Xeno Discovery has the same need for multicast as EDS, because that's what you need if you want to do zero configuration and discovery, uh, its discovery protocol is overall more robust to network restrictions because it only has a very small amount of multicast in use, then it switches to unicast, and then finally to TCP. The discovery load of Xeno is much less than EDS, and it is far less likely to bring down a network due to a discovery storm and it's better suited by design to modern distributed robot applications where you have, for example, a fleet of robots in a warehouse talking to a fleet management system that's in, located in the cloud over the internet. So we think Xeno has the potential to provide a much smoother, problem-free, out-of-the-box experience for new users of ROS2 without needing manual configuration. And this is what we're aiming for, so that new users who come to ROS2 find that it works well for them, and then once they understand what their needs are, they can choose a middleware that matches their specific needs. So thank you for your attention uh, and I look forward to any questions you may have.